We took turns at my sleepover trying to tell the scariest story we could. I think I won. George yawned and fidgeted on the carpet. The light from my bedside lamp caught his blonde hair and made it shine like a halo. He twirled a lock from his fringe around his index finger, let it snap back into place, then started twirling it again. The kid looked bored. He'd obviously agreed to come round mine for a sleepover because I was new at school and he wanted to see what kind of house I lived in. Get a sense of what I was like. But I could tell he was already regretting the decision. I thought you said you had a PS4. George's eyes flicked around the bedroom as if he was hoping the console would magically appear from somewhere. We'd been upstairs since dinner. He'd explored my room and we chatted for a bit, then watched some random shows on Netflix. Things were going okay at first, but as the last light bled out of the day and the sky outside darkened, I could tell George was losing interest. That was when I suggested we do something a bit different. Nah, I don't have one, I said. Sorry. Are you still up for having a go at this game, though? What, telling each other stories? Isn't that little kid stuff? George glanced at the watch on his wrist. I followed his gaze. George's watch was the first thing I noticed about him. He sits in front of me in English, and I spotted the watch after a ray of sunlight glinted off its face and caught my eye. It's a really nice watch. Most of the kids in my year have digital watches those blocky ones that light up when you press a button on the side but George's watch was different. More adult. It was one of the reasons I'd pick George to invite to over. Hey, can I try your watch on? George looked up at me and frowned. What? Your watch. Can I try it on? It's really nice. George stared at me for a second longer. One hand moved to touch the strap on his wrist, as if to make sure it was still secure. Sorry, I don't let anyone try my watch on. My dad says I'm not allowed. He glanced around the room once more, his eye going from the door to the dark window. He sighed. Okay, let's play this dumb game then. What do I have to do? Ignoring the bored look on his face, I smiled. It's really easy. We just take turns telling each other a scary story. Like, the scariest story you can possibly think of. Then whoever's is the scariest wins the game. George rolled his eyes. He stretched his long legs out in front of him. I don't know any scary stories. Besides, I think I might get some sleep soon. I'm pretty tired. Come on, just one each. You must know at least one scary story. Everyone does. Plus, I know loads of good ones. I watched George's face for a reaction. Unless you're one of those kids that frightens easily, that is. Then I guess you might not like the game. It was a risk, but George bit. I'm not scared of anything. The skin below his blonde hair creased into a frown. I've watched horror films with my big brother that are rated 18. We even found one on YouTube that's been banned and I still watched it. I didn't say anything. Just looked back at George and smiled. After a few seconds he let out another sigh. Fine, let's play your stupid game then. But after you're done done failing to scare me, that's it. I'm going to bed. George went first. His story wasn't bad, in fairness. It was one he said his uncle told him a couple of years back. Nothing I hadn't heard before. Basically there are two kids, and one of them gets hit by a car and dies. After the funeral, the mother gives the surviving kid some money to go and get liver from the store. Something to cook up for dinner. Because he's sick in the head, though, the kid pockets the money, digs up his brother, and removes his liver instead. Then later that night, the dead brother rises from his grave to come and get the kid in his sleep. It's a decent enough story, but I'd heard it a hundred times already. I didn't let on, though. I made all the right faces and jumped at the right parts. George got quite into it. He gestured his arms and his watch glinted in the light from my bedside lamp. His blonde hair spilled across his forehead. He was so into the story he didn't seem to notice. After it was over he sat back, brushed the hair from his eyes, and grinned. 
I thought you were gonna shit yourself at one point, he said. You might as well give up now, anyway. I'm not scared of anything. I looked across the room at him. The house was quiet now and had been for a few hours. When we'd first come upstairs there was still noise coming from below, the faint sound of the TV in the lounge, the rattle of plates being put away in the kitchen. Now there was only silence. Beyond the bedroom window, tree branches rustled in the wind. The occasional car passed by on the road outside. That was it. I grinned at George. So you're not scared of anything at all? Nope. Nothing. Not even stories that are true? George let out a bark of laughter. Nice try. Just hurry up and get it over with, will you? I'm already bored. Okay, fine. I shuffled forwards on the carpet so I was sat closer to George. Our knees were almost touching. George frowned, but he didn't move. My story is about a family, I began. A family that looks normal enough on the outside, but isn't really normal at all. George rolled his eyes again. He was starting to annoy me quite a lot by now, but I didn't let on. I just carried on with the story as if I hadn't noticed. This family moves around a lot. They never stay in one place for too long. They can't, you see, the family is good at disguising themselves, they're good at hiding their secret, but they still can't go taking risks. If they stayed in one place for any more than a few weeks, they might get found out. Someone might discover what they really are. So what are they then? I wanted to tell George not to interrupt to just sit still and listen to the story, but I bit down the urge. Instead, I just grinned at him. The family are monsters, I said. They're all monsters. They travel from town to town, and they leave a trail of dead kids wherever they go. I paused, expecting George to interrupt me again, but he didn't. He only stared back at me. There was no expression on his face as he twirled a lock of blonde hair round his finger. The family has a very specific way of doing things, I continued. When they move into a new area, they find a house that's been left unoccupied. Not a completely empty house, just one where the people that normally live there are off on holiday or something. One that'll be empty for a week or two. The family doesn't need long, see. A couple of weeks suits them just fine. So they break into this house, and then they go about setting the trap. It's their own kid they use. They send him off to make friends in the neighborhood. Round the nearby parks, maybe off to the local school under a fake name. Tell him to get to know the other kids. The family is hungry by this point really, badly hungry but they don't do anything just yet. They've learned to be patient. I paused and took a breath. This was a story I'd told before but I found I liked it more and more with each retelling. The trick was not to rush, though. You had to savor it. I'd opened the bedroom window when we first came upstairs, and now a draft of cold air blew in. It ruffled the curtains behind George. Tree branches shook in the garden outside, the leaves whispering to each other. George watched me, not saying anything. I had his attention. The kids' parents don't have to wait long, I continued. They never do. They've trained the kid well, see? He's not just a victim in all this. He may only be young, but he knows how the game works. Once the family has been in the area for a little while a few days, maybe a week at most the kid makes his choice. He picks a new friend to invite back to their house. The parents give him an incentive, too. He's still too young to share the tastes they have they tell him that's something he'll only acquire when he gets older but he still gets something out of it. What does he get out of it? George's eyes were fixed on mine. His finger kept twirling the same lock of hair over and over again. He gets the other kid's stuff, I replied. Whoever he picks. He gets to keep all their belongings after his parents are finished with them. Somewhere in the house below us, a door slammed. George's eyes flicked away from mine towards the bedroom door, then back again. I smiled at him. So, George kept his eyes on me as he tried to formulate the question. So, what exactly do the parents, what do they do with the kids they take? Oh, they eat them, I replied. They eat their insides. 
They tear the kids open while they're still screaming, and they pull out their guts and intestines by the handful. Wolf everything down until there's nothing left but a husk. I grinned. Somewhere below us, a floorboard creaked. The sound was faint and muffled, and I don't think George heard it. Can you imagine what someone looks like when they've had everything inside them removed? They hardly even look like a person at all. It's like the stuff a snake leaves behind when it sheds its skin. The glow from the bedside lamp made George's skin look pale. His lips were slightly parted as he stared at me. But how did they get away with it? He asked. Don't the parents of the kids that get taken come looking for them the next day? When their kids don't show up back home? I grinned back at George. I'd been hoping he'd ask this. Oh, the family's long gone by that point, I said. They vanish like shadows in the night. The only thing they take with them is the remains of the dead kid. And when their parents come looking for them the next day, all they find is a locked house that belongs to somebody else. Another floorboard creaked. It was louder this time, and we both heard it. The sound had come from the corridor outside the bedroom. George's head swiveled in the direction of the door. His eyes were wide in his pale face. What was that? Oh, that was nothing, I lied. Probably just the house settling. There's nothing to be scared of, George. I eyed the watch on his wrist. And imagined what it would look like on mine.